Okay. <laughs> okay. So, you want to put just a time to. Okay. So, can you tell us um, w uh, why the Markava tank was uh, created? What was the idea? Well, uh, the first problem that Israel faced in the uh, late 1960s is that no country in the world was willing to, s to sell Israel new, m new tanks. We had uh, used tanks back from France in the 1950s, uh, uh, IMX Express, IMX uh, 13, at, uh, and we had uh, uh, later used M48, but after 1967, uh, we had difficulties. Uh, there was a project uh, to develop with the United Kingdom the chieftain tank. The, the, in the late 1960s, Britain was developing the chieftain and Israel was cooperating uh, with the promise that the tank, once it's developed, would be also sold to Israel. But then in 1969, the, the United Kingdom informed Israel that it wouldn't sell it new tanks. And so the decision was made then that if the Israeli defense forces want new tanks, they would have to uh, develop it by themselves. It was a very tough decision. It was very, very difficult to get because developing a tank is a very complex uh, matter and not many countries in the world are doing it and uh, it was highly debated but uh, eventually uh, the project was set off with the first product uh, the first Merkava uh, entering service in 1979 and why Merkava the name uh, the name first was uh, the name of the project Merkava in, he in Hebrew means chariot just chariot and uh, it will at first was a code name for, for the whole project, and then it evolved and just stayed, remained there as the name of the tank. The first big challenge for this tank was uh, the war in Lebanon in 1982. Um, uh, yes. The, those, um, the tank was like, okay, what did... Um, the tank was okay, uh, I mean, um, and very successful. It was, uh, I'll say a few things about the design of the tank, which is very unique in the world. Almost all modern tanks have, for example, the engine in the back. Merkava is the only tank in the world with the engine in front. Why is that? Because when you design a tank, uh, you have to balance between things. I mean, you, you can't have it all. You, you need firepower, you need protection, you need mobility, and it's, it is always one thing uh, has to balance other, other things, because if you want uh, excellent firepower, you'd have to lose the fair protection for, uh, for the crew, or, or you'd have to lose mobility. Uh, the Merkava designers decided that the most important thing would be uh, protection of the crew, survivability of the crew. And since usually in the tactics of until the late 1990s, a tank would always fire forward and probably get a counter fire from the front. The front is always, in all the tanks, it would be uh, the heaviest armor. In the Merkava, they added the engine. So if somebody hits the tank, there's armor, and then there is the engine and the crew behind the engine. So you might lose the engine, and you will, one might lose uh, the, uh, your mobility, but you'd protect the, so the crew. So was it a good idea? Did it change after? In the no, other and this is, uh, this is the, the concept that you have in all the Merkava, all the versions of the Merkava. What it gave the Merkava uh, was something is also very unique. In all the tanks in the world, the crew enters from the top. The, this is the only entrance. The Merkava has an entrance from the back. And the Merkava, the room, there is room there for 
can carry up to, uh, in addition to the crew, which is usually three people, three soldiers, it can house, I don't know if they ever did it in combat, but it can house up to 10 soldiers. Of course, you have to take out the ammunition because the ammunition takes a lot of uh, space. But, uh, and again, this is going from the, uh, from the back, uh, on, uh, which you have to give up things for that, but you, you gain uh, survivability for the crew. Anyway, the tank of war. Uh, if you ask me about the First Lebanon War, uh, technically the tank was very successful. It's a very difficult, different question whether the Israeli armor was successful in Lebanon because Lebanon uh, was, the terrain is not very suitable for uh, uh, armor uh, combat. Uh, tanks are usually limited to roads, whereas if you compare it, uh, let's compare it to the two uh, well, uh, uh, utmost uh, combat, uh, uh, armored combat. If you take, for example, uh, nine, uh, 1943 Kursk in the Second World War, or if you take uh, uh, the battles of uh, in the Sinai Desert, tanks spread over large area and run forward. You can't do that in a, in a mountain uh, area. Um, maybe the only region in Lebanon where you can think of real armor uh, combat is uh, the region of Marjayun. But uh, it's highly debated how much uh, the Israeli armor succeeded in the uh, First Lebanon War. There's no question that technically the Merkava was very successful and uh, of course uh, there were many technical lessons learned which led to the development uh, by 1982 the Merkava Mark II was already in development but uh, the experience led to the development of Merkava Mark III and later uh, Merkava Mark IV, which entered, was already operational in uh, the Second Lebanon War. Which kind of improvement did they face since the beginning until the Merkava IV generation? Okay. You had the Merkava Mark I, as, uh, or we used the he Hebrew uh, word Siman. Siman uh, one, Siman two, Siman three, and Siman four, which is now uh, the model being the current model. I read only in last month's paper that uh, the Ministry of Defense is con now beginning to consider the next generation, which nobody knows yet whether it would be Merkava Mark Seven, Mark five or something completely different. <laughs> anyway, if you are, we are talking about uh, development, Mark I and uh, Siman I and Siman II were very similar. They both had engine of uh, about 900 horsepower. They both had, uh, the cannon was 105 millimeters. Uh, there were some changes in the turret, in the defense, in the, uh, in the armor. Uh, But Mark I and Mark II were quite similar to each other. Mark III was a real jump forward. It was really m many, many changes. The first is a much stronger en engine, which was uh, 1,200 uh, horsepower. The second, much more important, was uh, the cannon. They changed the 105 millimeters to 120 millimeters. Uh, which is a uh, smooth ball, whereas the 155 millimeters is uh, is rifled. Uh, the 100, uh, the 120 millimeters smooth ball, which enables to sh fire modern NATO uh, ammunition. Most modern uh, NATO tanks use 120 millimeters. The Leopard uh, A2, the Challenger, 
the Abrams, the American Abrams, they all fire use 120 millimeters. And uh, so there is commonality of ammunition. These missile, these cannons can fire type some, some types of, uh, of uh, anti-tank missiles. Um, very advanced. The armor was changed completely, much more uh, stronger armor. The tank is of course heavier and that's why it needed more, uh, uh, more horsepower. Uh, there were changes in the wheels uh, uh, and the most important thing in modern weaponry, whether tanks, uh, aircraft, is not the hardware but the software, the brain. You have a new, the Mark III uh, entered with a new software, new uh, weapon control system, computerized, which enables things that tanks in the uh, previous generation couldn't have dreamt of. Uh, you can balance the cannon, you can fire while in movement, all the tanks has to come to position, stand, stable, aim the cannon and fire. The modern system, the, the cannon is stabilized and the tank can go on rocks, but the cannon always aims at the uh, target. And you can't do it, a human being cannot do that. You, have, you need computerized system, which enable very accurate fire that other tanks cannot have. It enables also uh, what is called uh, much better uh, environmental awareness. I mean, you have all kinds of sensor which tell the people inside, the commander, the gunner, uh, the driver, what are the threats around them, day and night. And uh, this was a real jump forward and the Mark IV, the Siman IV, which is even more advanced and all these things. It has a stronger engine. Okay, so you want to ask something. And would you say that despite all this um, new, uh, new stuff in the tank, uh, the war in 2006 with Hezbollah was the biggest challenge for the Markava? Uh, it was, yes, it was a challenge. And again, first of all, uh, it must be uh, understood in all weapon system. There, um, there is no such thing as 100% defense. Absolutely no. If so, if a tank, uh, the, the mine, for let's say the mines, the standard mines that were in use since World War II against armor, they weigh something like seven, eight, seven, eight kilos, which was enough to stop a tank then. Now you build a tank that can withstand a mine that weighs 10 kilos. It wouldn't stand a mine that weighs 100 kilos. Uh, what Hezbollah did in uh, 2006 is really hide, uh, explosive charges in the ground with uh, way over 100 kilos. Uh, there is no uh, uh, tank in the world that can withstand them. But on the other hand, carrying a few hundred kilos of ammunition, of uh, explosive, is something very difficult. You cannot do it in, in combat. You have to prepare it long in advance and very little, uh, very few of them. They had very good use, of, a lot of use of uh, modern uh, uh, anti tank uh, missiles. Again, Tank can withstand one, two, but not ten. Um, and a lot of the damage that was caused to tanks in uh, the Second Lebanon uh, War was caused because of errors uh, of the Israeli operators. I mean, the, the 
they were uh, criticized for the way the battle was conducted and putting t tanks in danger again and again and again. By the way, there were many, there were few, ca there were casualties. All the tanks, except one that were damaged, were damaged in, uh, su in such a way that they were within a year returned to service. So, basically, the defense was good as much as you can buy with money. And as I said before, you always have to balance fire, the cost, the firepower, the mobility. You can build a tank that would withstand anything, but it would be so heavy that it wouldn't move. Uh, <laughs> was it a, a surprise uh, for the Israeli army to find out that Hezbollah um, owns anti-missile uh, this was to some surprise because uh, we knew, I think, we knew that uh, s these missiles uh, were sold to Syria. We didn't know they were transferred from Syria to, uh, to uh, Lebanon, to, the, to Hezbollah. These were, these were very modern uh, Russian-made uh, anti-tank missiles. Uh, this was kind of surprise, and I think uh, what the IDF, uh, in a way, failed to realize is, uh, uh, the way Hezbollah was organized. I mean, uh, what kind of uh, organization it was. They did not, Hezbollah has become an army, and quite a regular army. They did not appreciate uh, correctly or to the uh, needed extent uh, the understanding that they were not fighting against a small terrorist group, but against a mili uh, military, well-organized, big military organization. Uh, if they did appreciate that, uh, I think the, the battle would have been uh, differently conceived, differently uh, uh, run uh, in practice. Uh, which wouldn't make it uh, any easier, but advanced planning and uh, it's always a good key for success in, uh, in combat. So the defeat, in a way, of the Markava during the uh, Lebanon war in 2006 is more due to Hezbollah uh, fightings or it's more due to technical problems, would you no, say? No, uh, well, the Markava was not defeated. Uh, that, that's uh, well, that's uh, what I'm trying to say. The Merkava as a tank was not defeated. It, it, it did suffer, but when you send a combat uh, unit into battle, you expect that you'll have some casualties. Uh, so uh, suffering casualties in combat in itself is not a defeat. Uh, the combat was run uh, organized, conducted uh, not optimally, I would say, and uh, the lack of sufficient success uh, for the combat unit was uh, tactical, not technical. So uh, the tank itself was not defeated. The I, I wouldn't say even that, that the forces were defeated. They were not defeated, but they did not as achieve the success that uh, they wanted. They did not defeat, uh, but again, their orders were not to defeat Hezbollah completely. This was not the aim of the, uh, the combat. And this is what, what was one of the problem in uh, the Second World Lebanon War that uh, aims strategic aims uh, for the battle were not defined. So uh, the failure, I would say, was much more to the highest echelon than the fighting units. And after uh, this war, do you think the army try, uh, started to work on new improvements on the Markava? No, and well, there, there are, yes, there are some improvements uh, that are being uh, developed. One of them, uh, with the most important of them, was uh, the trophy. The trophy 
uh, actually two different systems. One of them is trophy and the other one is, I forgot the name. One of them is def developed by uh, ELTA and the other one is developed by uh, the Israeli uh, military industry. Anyway, these systems are designed to uh, intercept and intercept incoming missiles and incoming uh, uh, shells and explode them before they hit the tank. The same idea, by the way, that Iron Dome is working against rocket. And this, these systems are being developed all over the world for many years. They haven't been very successful until now, but now you have systems appearing all over the world. And the idea is that the next generation of tanks all over the world, and that's why I said probably the next generation of tank in Israel would not be the Merkava Mark V, but something completely different. Something that relies not on armor, not on passive armor, but on systems that would intercept the incoming uh, missiles. So you'd have a tank, now if the tanks are in the around the world are between 60 and 70 tons. Uh, the, 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 Merkava, the, the way of the Merkava itself has not been officially published, but it's between 60 and 70 ton, uh, depending on how, uh, what equipment is put on it. The next generation would probably be tanks with the weight of not more than 20 tons. But instead of very thick armor, very heavy armor, you'd have all kinds of system rockets that whenever a missile or a missile is coming on the tank, it would fire a missile against it and explode it some distance away from the tank. Uh, of course, you need very, very fast uh, radars, very, very uh, strong computerized systems with very fast, uh, uh, very fast calculations because these things are coming at something like 1,500, 2,000 uh, meters per second, and they are very fast. And you have not more than five, six, seven seconds between uh, detecting this threat and calculating and firing against it. Uh, so all you would need is uh, protection from below against mines. Again, you uh, probably would have uh, modern detection system, modern radars that can penetrate the ground and to discover these uh, mines before you step on them. And modern radars that would have uh, to identify threats and system to intercept these different types of threats. And you need armor thick enough to protect against uh, rifles, against automatic fire, uh, not mm, something like that. And of course, a way to carry the, your, your cannon and your uh, missiles or whatever you are carrying. This would probably be the next generation. Uh, my last question. Um, after all these experiences the Markava faced, uh, did the tank, to your opinion, achieve its goal? And especially the goal of uh, in uh, protecting the soldiers? Well, in protecting the soldiers, I think it has. It is one of the... It, in terms of protecting the soldiers, I think it's still the best in the world. Uh, other goals, it's a big question, uh, what are the goals of the tank? Uh, when I did some reading uh, prior to this uh, interview, I found a very interesting article, it was written in English, but I couldn't find the English uh, original, so, but I did find Hebrew translation, and the headline was, is the tank dead? It was written by a, an American uh, colonel and it was published in August 1950. <laughs> August 1950. So uh, the tank has been dead, the tank all over the world has been dead for 63 years now and it would probably continue to die the next 60 years. <laughs> so we will still see some tanks uh, made in Israel and to fight uh, for, with the Israeli army. 
Um, I guess, well, armies are notoriously conservative organizations, but uh, I think tanks still have uses. Uh, some users, some users, and would have, and they would have to change as the type of warfare is being changed. Uh, for example, the Merkava that was built for uh, armor to armor combats, the kind type that we had, I think the last armor to armor combat in the world was in uh, Sinai and in the Rogolan Heights in 1973. There haven't been any since. Uh, was less suitable, but did find uh, its adaptations for uh, uh, fighting, for example, the Intifada, fighting in the Lebanon war, uh, and would continue to do so. I hope that the IDF would not be uh, would not resemble the British Army that in 1924 uh, had a very introduced into service something very, very advanced, a very advanced and very modern sword for cavalry. And that was in 1924, 10 years after the beginning of the First World War, a uh, few years uh, before the Second World War. When Tanks were already fighting in the battlefields, when aircraft were fighting in the battlefield, when cavalry was gone almost all over the world, they were still developing new swords for the cavalry. I really hope that the IDF would not continue to develop tanks when the tank is really dead. But as long as it is alive, I still hope that we'll have good tanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I know, because they are yeah. waiting for the Lebanon cruise mm. and our... And the whole program would be one hour or...? Oh yeah, I think it's a, yeah, it's going to be a documentary, a big a long feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I will keep you posted for sure. Thank okay. you so... Okay. Okay. So you're gonna look at me. Yeah. Okay. So why did um, why did Israel decide at the very beginning to create uh, the Markava tank? Well, uh, Israel would have preferred to buy tanks from abroad, and actually, after certain liberations, Israel chose the British chieftain in the early 1970s. And the British hesitated, and uh, first they were ready to sell it, and they backed down, and finally they gave a, ne a negative answer. And this Wh was the lesson that we couldn't be dependent on foreign uh, sources of uh, the Markava tank. Well, Israel, after the Six Day War, looked for tanks abroad. And uh, she would have liked to buy the British chieftain, which was the best tank at his 
its time in the early 1970s. And uh, the British first were ready to sell it because they needed money, then they backed down, and finally they gave a negative answer. So they didn't want to be involved in selling arms to Israel in a conflict with the Arab states and their interests in the Arab state. For the Israelis, it was a lesson because it showed that we couldn't afford to be dependent on foreign sources for major war systems war, or weapon systems. And why didn't you ask uh, the Americans? The Americans provided batons and Pershing's M M48 and the M60s, but we looked for the next generation. And I don't believe that Brit the Americans at that time had the Abrams anyhow. The Americans di didn't want in the early 70s to be the only suppliers of arms to Israel. They were ready to supply aircraft. They were far less ready to supply other weapon systems. And then emerged the idea of let's produce our own tank. And the main advocate of this idea was the late General Israel Tal, who was considered an expert and a genius in tank warfare across the world. And uh, most of his colleagues didn't like the idea. They thought that the Israelis shouldn't invest money and uh, efforts and energies in producing platform for was other war systems. And uh, it would be, for a small state like Israel, preferable to invest in producing unique systems that others don't produce, or don't sell at least. Uh, <coughs> I believe that they were right, because the, the tank, as well as the aircraft at the time, the Lavi, were too big for Israel. Too big? Too big for Israel. It is uh, logical to produce a platform if you can sell it abroad. I think that to this very day that no other army uses the Merkaba. <laughs> so no one buys it from Israel. And the uh, expenses of developing the, the platform are carried solely by Israel. When you sell it abroad, you have partners who finance the, the developing. Yeah, so what was the first um, test for the Markava? What the was the first operation? Operational test was in the first Lebanon war. And this was, I believe, the Merkava Mark I. And by that time, we had hardly two brigades of far from replacing the whole armored core of Merkaba, but the, the prices were huge. Because uh, when, you <coughs> when you determine the price of a tank, you pay for the development and for the production. The more you produce, the share of the investment is reduced. When we bought two brigades, well, we had to pay for the entire developing process. This was a huge investment. And how did it go during this first Lebanon war? It was worked well. It worked better than other tanks. It has its own uh, childhood diseases <laughs> which we had to, to overcome, but it went well and then we developed it. Mark II and Mark III and Mark IV on the basis of the lessons of the earlier models. And so what was the lessons of the earliest model? Oh, well, it's all technical. It's a very technical problem. The, the major issue was whether it's worthwhile to develop a platform. A second a major controversial issue was what should be the priority, mobility or protection. A tank is a mobile weapon system. It should move, it should move quickly, it should be fast, 
the same time, it gives protection to the crew. Now, the more protection you give, the more weight you put on the tank, and the mobility is reduced. <laughs> so you have to find the optimum balance between mobility and uh, protection. A third element is the uh, <coughs> firepower. <coughs> oh, the Merkaba had a, <coughs> a modern gun. I think better than most of the guns at the time, the early 80s. But until the early 80s, Israeli tanks, and I believe most Western tanks, had uh, 105 millimeter guns. The Merkaba had 120, I believe, or 115, which had a longer range, and heavier <coughs> firepower, and this was uh, certainly an advantage. It was, uh, or it gave to the crew better protection and the more advanced models or types give even better uh, protection, but this is at the expense of weight and mobility. Uh, mobility, well, it can cross all sorts of obstacles, but it is very, very heavy. I believe it's about 60 tons or something like that. It's crazy. And the Markava, it's like, um, it's better to be used like in, a, I don't know, cities operation or in a... F no, uh, tanks are usually built for tanks against tanks battles <laughs> in the open. <laughs> the reason the, the Merkava is so heavily protected is because it is used not against enemy tanks, but against uh, uh, explosives and... Uh, small warfare uh, weapons. So uh, the idea is not to, to crush an enemy tank at t uh, three miles or five miles, but to survive in a built area like the Gaza Strip or Lebanese town or whatever. <laughs> in this sense, it, it fulfills its role now. The question is what will happen to it if, and it's a very big if, it will be ever used in a tank-to-tank -tank battle. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, we almost know that it won't. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which enemy? The Syrian army? <laughs> the Jordanian army? The Egyptian army? Uh, so... The, the enemy now is not regular armies like they used to be in the 1970s or even the 1980s in Lebanon, the main enemy was the Syrian army, not the uh, PLO. <laughs> uh, even today, maybe the Hezbollah. Well, Hezbollah has no tanks. So we can't see tank against tank battle. But it's tank against anti-tank warfare. And in this kind of uh, <coughs> encounter, protection is more important. The tanks will not run in 50 miles per hour. It will move slowly from house to house. <laughs> and the idea that the crew will have a better protection is certainly paramount. <laughs> so in a way, the Markava, it's, um, uh, how would I put it? Like, it's very unique. Yes, it's a, f it's a mobile fortress. And it, we can only see it in Israel, this kind of fortress, I mean, this kind of... Uh no, the Americans have similar problems with the Abrams, and the Egyptians had the Abrams tanks, the American tanks. They are lighter than the Merkaba. Okay. Um but still, they are quite heavy, <laughs> and compared to, to World War II tanks, also to the 1960 tanks, they are far more heavier. And what, um, why did the, Isra the Israeli army change after the Markava to, to create a, a generation two and three and four? Why? Oh, this happens all over the world. You develop a weapon system, you try it, not 
experimentally. You try it in the field. You learn the lesson and you improve it. And every new model is an improvement of the previous one. And it's not a general improvement. It improves certain aspects. So would you say that the Markava uh, fulfill its goal? It's like uh, the core goal of the Markava? Uh, like protection of the crew? Certainly. The Markava 4, I believe, I don't know, more than the previous uh, types. There were Merk uh, at least one case when Merkava <coughs> stepped, drove on moved on a, an explosive below and was blown up and the crew was killed. Since then, they added a few plates of armor on the floor and now it's safe. <laughs> but it's like the goal, at, the goal at the beginning for Israeli army, it was to try to protect more the soldiers no, uh, Tal's idea was to create a tank that would also protect the crew. Uh, with the years, I think protection became a value because the life of the crew were more valuable. In the attitude of Israeli society, this has nothing to do with tanks. It, does, it has to do with uh, social moods, atmosphere, discourse. And uh, the role of life in the discourse has changed. This is the reason, not the tactical or technical military reason. <laughs> okay, so societal reason, yeah, okay. Um, and the, uh, we say that the, enemy, the enemies of Israel, so for example in uh, Hezbollah, they have the, do you think they have the means to defeat the Israeli army right now? Defeat? No, but they don't want to defeat. <laughs> An underground organization doesn't look to defeat the enemy. For, for the Hezbollah to survive a war is a victory. <laughs> he doesn't have to defeat the idea. <laughs> it's an asymmetrical war. Uh, uh, uh. No, maybe a last question. Um, what do you think? What what were the biggest challenges the Markava had to face? Facing the field or facing the process of development? Mm, I would say both in both areas. In the process of development, the, the challenge was to create the ideal combination of speed, mobility on the one hand, protection and firepower. In the field it didn't have real challenges because it didn't confront so far other tanks except a little in the, the battles against the Syrian in the first Lebanese war. But most battles were not fought with the Syrians were not fought by the Merkava, <laughs> but by other types of tanks. Uh, against uh, Hamas or Hezbollah, uh, these are not challenges for tanks. <laughs> I see. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just gonna take a few <laughs> That's your dog? Ah, it used to be forty years ago. <laughs>